Anyone who looks through enough statistics will eventually find numbers that seem to confirm a given vision. Often, the same set of statistics contains other numbers that seem to confirm diametrically opposite conclusions. The same is true of anecdotal facts. That is why evidence is different from mere data, whether numerical or verbal. Scientific evidence, for example, comes from systematically determining, in advance, what particular empirical observations would be seen if one theory were correct, compared to what would be seen if an alternative theory were correct. Only after this careful and painstaking analysis has been completed can the search begin for facts that will differentiate between the competing theories. Seldom is this approach used by those who believe in the vision of the anointed. More typically, they look through statistics until they find some numbers that fit their preconceptions and then cry, aha! Others with different views can, of course, do the same thing, but only those with the prevailing views are likely to be taken seriously when using such shaky reasoning. This is only one of many misuses of statistics that goes unchallenged as long as the conclusions are consonant with the vision of the anointed. AHA STATISTICS Perhaps the purest examples of the problems of the AHA approach are sets of statistics which themselves contain numbers completely at odds with the conclusions drawn from other numbers in the same set. This is not as rare as might be expected. Infant Mortality and Prenatal Care A widely reported study from the National Center for Health Statistics showed that 1. Black pregnant women in the United States received prenatal care less often than white pregnant women, and that 2. Infant mortality rates among blacks were substantially higher than among whites. Aha! Reactions in the media were immediate, vehement, and widespread. It was automatically assumed that the first fact was the cause of the second, that this showed American society's neglect of its minorities, if not outright racism, and that what was needed was more government spending on prenatal care. According to a New York Times editorial, one-fourth of the infant deaths in the United States were easily preventable and were primarily attributable to their mother's lack of prenatal care. What was needed was an increase in federal spending on prenatal care. The Washington Post likewise urged legislation to provide vital assistance to pregnant women who cannot afford normal medical care. In the very same report that showed racial disparities in infant mortality, indeed on the very same page, statistics showed that 1. Mexican Americans received even less prenatal care than blacks, and that 2. Infant mortality rates among Mexican Americans were no higher than among whites. Had anyone been seriously interested in testing an hypothesis, the conclusion would have been that something other than prenatal care must have been responsible for intergroup differences in infant mortality. That conclusion would have been further buttressed by data on infant mortality rates for Americans of Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino ancestry, all of whom received less prenatal care than whites and yet had lower infant mortality rates than whites. But, of course, no one with the vision of the anointed was looking for any such data, so there was no aha. In a reprise of the pattern of justification for government spending on the war on poverty, it has been claimed that money invested in prenatal care will prevent costly health problems, thereby saving money in the long run. Various numbers have been thrown around, claiming that for every dollar spent on prenatal care, there is a saving of $1.70, $2.57, or $3.38, depending on which study you believe. Marion Wright Edelman of the Children's Defense Fund, for example, used the $3.38 figure. However, a careful analysis of these studies in the New England Journal of Medicine found such claims unsubstantiated. What is even more striking was the response to these damaging findings. Dr. Marie McCormick, chairman of the Department of Maternal and Fetal Health at the Harvard School of Public Health, said it was true that justification of these services on a cost-benefit analysis is a weak read, but added that people were reduced to this sort of effort by politicians reluctant to spend money on services for the poor. In other words, if they told the truth, they wouldn't get the money. Invalid statistics serve the purpose of allowing the anointed to preempt the decision by telling the public only what will gain political support. Intergroup Disparities Media and academic preoccupation with black-white comparisons permits many conclusions to be reached in consonance with the prevailing vision, but whose lack of validity would immediately become apparent if just one or two other groups were included in the comparison. For example, 
The fact that black applicants for mortgage loans are turned down at a higher rate than white applicants has been widely cited as proof of racism among lending institutions. The Washington Post, for example, reported that a racially biased system of home lending exists, and Jesse Jackson called it criminal activity that banks routinely and systematically discriminate against African Americans and Latinos in making mortgage loans. But the very same data also showed that whites were turned down at a higher rate than Asian Americans. Was that proof of racism against whites and in favor of Asians? Similarly, a statistical analysis of the racial impact of layoffs during the recession of 1990 and 91 turned up the fact that blacks were laid off at a higher rate than whites or others. Although this was a news story, as distinguished from an editorial, the story was sufficiently larded with quotations alleging racism that it was clear what conclusion the reader was supposed to draw. However, here again. Asian American workers fared better than white workers, nor could this be attributed to high-tech skills among Asian Americans. Even among laborers, Asian Americans increased their employment at a time when white, black, and Hispanic laborers were all losing jobs. Yet no one claimed that this showed discrimination against whites and in favor of Asians. Such Asian-white statistical disparities cause no aha because their implications are not part of the prevailing vision. In short. Numbers are accepted as evidence when they agree with preconceptions, but not when they don't. In many cases, academic and media comparisons limited to blacks and whites, even when data on other groups are available in the same reports or from the same sources, may reflect nothing more than indolence. However, in other cases, there is a positive effort made to put other kinds of comparisons off limits by lumping all non-whites together as people of color in the United States, visible minorities in Canada. Or generic blacks in Britain, where the term encompasses Chinese, Pakistanis, and others. Whatever the rationale for this lumping together of highly disparate groups, its net effect is to suppress evidence that would undermine conclusions based on aha statistics, and with it undermine the prevailing vision of the anointed. Perhaps the best known use of the aha approach is to prove discrimination by statistics showing intergroup disparities. Once again. These inferences are drawn only where they are consonant with the prevailing vision. No one regards the gross disparity in representation between blacks and whites in professional basketball as proving discrimination against whites in that sport. Nor does anyone regard the gross overrepresentation of blacks among the highest-paid players in baseball as showing discrimination. The point here is not that whites are being discriminated against. But that a procedure which leads logically to this absurd conclusion is being taken in deadly seriousness when the conclusion fits the vision of the anointed. In short, what is claimed by the anointed to be evidence is clearly recognized by them as not being evidence when its conclusions do not fit the prevailing vision. Implicit in the equating of statistical disparity with discrimination is the assumption that gross disparities would not exist in the absence of unequal treatment. However. International studies have repeatedly shown gross intergroup disparities to be commonplace all over the world, whether in alcohol consumption, fertility rates, educational performance, or innumerable other variables. A reasonably comprehensive listing of such disparities would be at least as large as a dictionary. However, a manageably selective list can be made of disparities in which it is virtually impossible to claim that the statistical differences in question are due to discrimination. One. American men are struck by lightning six times as often as American women. Two, during the days of the Soviet Union, per capita consumption of cognac in Estonia was more than seven times what it was in Uzbekistan. Three, for the entire decade of the 1960s, members of the Chinese minority in Malaysia received more university degrees than did members of the Malay majority, including more than 400 degrees in engineering compared to four for the Malays. Four. In the days of the Ottoman Empire, when non-Muslims were explicitly second class under the law, there were whole industries and sectors of the economy predominantly owned and operated by Christian minorities, notably Greeks and Armenians. Five, when Nigeria became an independent nation in 1960, most of its riflemen came from the northern regions, while most of its officers came from southern regions. As late as 1965, half the officers were members of the Ibo tribe. A southern group historically disadvantaged. Six, in Bombay, capital of India's state of Maharashtra, most of the business executives are non-Maharashtrian, and in the state of Assam, most of the businessmen, construction workers, artisans, and members of various professions are non-Assamese.
7. Within the white community of South Africa, as late as 1946, the Afrikaners earned less than half the income of the British, even though the Afrikaners were politically predominant. 8. As of 1921, members of the Tamil minority in Ceylon outnumbered members of the Sinhalese majority in both the medical and the legal professions. 9. A 1985 study in the United States showed that the proportion of Asian American students who scored over 700 on the mathematics portion of the Scholastic Aptitude Test, SAT, was more than double the proportion among whites. 10. In Fiji, people whose ancestors immigrated from India, usually to become plantation laborers, received several times as many university degrees as the indigenous Fijians, who still own most of the land. 11. Although Germans were only about 1% of the population of Tsarist Russia, they were about 40% of the Russian army's high command, more than half of all the officials in the foreign ministry, and a large majority of the members of the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences. 12. In Brazil's state of São Paulo, more than two-thirds of the potatoes and more than 90% of the tomatoes have been grown by people of Japanese ancestry. 13. As early as 1887, more than twice as many Italian immigrants as Argentines had bank accounts in the Banco de Buenos Aires, even though most Italians arrived destitute in Argentina and began work in the lowest, hardest, and most menial jobs. 14. In mid-19th century Melbourne, more than half the clothing stores were owned by Jews, who have never been as much as 1% of Australia's population. 15. Even after the middle of the 20th century in Chile, most of the industrial enterprises in Santiago were controlled by either immigrants or the children of immigrants. Although these examples were deliberately selected to exclude cases where discrimination might plausibly have been regarded as the reason for the disparities, this in no way excludes the possibility that discrimination may be behind other disparities. The point here is that inferences cannot be made either way from the bare fact of statistical differences nor does it necessarily help to control statistically for other variables. Most social phenomena are sufficiently complex, with data on many variables being either unavailable or inherently unquantifiable, that often such control is itself illusory. That illusion will be analyzed as a special phenomenon which can be called the residual fallacy.